Hi, welcome to my channel. Today I will be discussing passive intermodulation with real life scenarios. I've, I've seen lots of videos circulating uh, in YouTube about PIM and explaining theoretically what PIM is, but to my knowledge, I haven't witnessed any videos where they show you how PIM is in a real life scenario. So hopefully this presentation can help shed some light on that. Let's get at it. Let's first talk about what is PIM. Well, PIM is a passive intermodulation. It's some kind of intermodulation distortion that can take place when no active components are present. By no active components, I mean passive components. Passive components can refer to anything from splitters, connectors, switches, or even antennas. When does it happen? Well, it can occur when two or more signals are present in, in a passive nonlinear device, such as previously mentioned connectors, switches, or antennas. Many engineers end up focusing on the passive devices when testing for PIM, and they forget about a phenomena called oxidation, which can also cause nonlinearity. And that could be an example of uh, oxidation could be rusty bolts. So if you have rusty bolts or rusty equipment, that can cause nonlinearity in the passive device leading to PIM. How does it happen? So basically, the main factors that cause it to happen is when you have an equipment, you've had it for a long time. So basically, as equipment age, also when you install new equipment, or even when multi -carri multiple carriers collocate their, their passive antennas and use the same old antenna runs. This could cause nonlinearity in the run and devices that could lead to PIM. What does PIM impact? I mean, what's the impact of PIM? So you need to know that PIM is considered a serious issue for cellular operators who want to maximize their network reliability, data rate, capacity, which can lead to positive return on investment. So the impact of PIM on the network would be creating interference that will reduce the cell receiver sensitivity, which may impact the network reliability, data rate, and so forth. As we all know, when we, the receiver sensi sensitivity drops, the cell coverage minim uh, is, is diminished. And when the cell coverage is diminished, we are serving less people. Less people means less return on investment. So you definitely don't, need, don't want that as a carrier. How can we mitigate PIM? So, I mean, the, the best way to detect PIM is through testing. Then you mitigate it by trying to figure out which of your devices has been old enough on the system, try to replace it. And you can try by one or two and several and then retest again and check for PIM. If nothing improved, we try to replace all passive components, including the antenna. There are lots of PIM rated passive devices now in the market you can purchase and replace the current old ones and this, this should give you a better results let's look at some of the scenarios i witnessed while working in the field so in the first example we're going to look at a base station it's an alamar system uh, uh, four radios so the first um, at first i'm going to show you what happens when all transmitters, four transmitters are off because I want to give you a reference to compare to. So while inspecting these uh, spectrum analyzer images, we look at the wide band. The wide band is I want to show you what's happening on, on a wider scale. Then we're going to look at the narrow band and see what's happening in our intended uh, spectrum or bandwidth where we're looking to see if we have PIM or by, by, by looking at the first image, we can see that we have few spikes towards the right. That tells me that my network already has some intermittent interference. And then I zoom in at the narrow band and I can see that more clearly in some of the spikes. Again, I'm looking here at the max hold. Uh, the reason we switch between max hold and, and the normal, normal you capture a moment, the max hold, you can let it settle for like 15, 20 seconds, and then take a screenshot. This will capture all the interferences or if any PIM exists, anything that's intermittent is gonna show up in the max hold. So in the second image, we can see we have existing interference. 
Luckily, none of the interference is impacting the four cursors. You see the three blue ones and the red ones. These are my receive channels. Not, none of the interference is impacting any of the channels. So the way you go about testing PIM is you start turning the transmitters one at a time and see what happens. So in the, in the next images, you're going to see that's when I have the four transmitters on. This should locate for you in the wide band where my four transmitters are. Then we look at the narrow band. The only thing we can notice, they still have some uh, intermittent interference, but we don't have any PIM. We don't have any spikes, basically, at my received channels. The only thing we can notice is that the noise floor was elevated. And that's normal when you turn more radio equipment, you turn them on, you, you anticipate and you expect the noise floor to rise. So that's normal. Now let's look at another scenario where I also witnessed while working in the field, also four radios and uh, four channels. And in this case, we're gonna see that we have PIM. So similarly, in the first image, I'm showing you the wide band and I'm showing you that there's an, there's an existing interferer. Luckily, again, it's outside my bandwidth. If we look at the narrow band, it's a more zoom in picture. You don't see that interferer. All my receive channels are in good shape. Still, I have none of the transmitters on. In the coming screenshots, I'm showing you now all the transmitters are on. And you can see these are my transmitters. Four of them are up. And now you can see the PIM. In the wide band, you can see all these spikes. These spikes were generated because of the four radios being on. All the radios are traveling through the same line using the same passive devices in terms of connectors and splitters, which led to these spikes. This is PIM. The spikes are PIM. You wouldn't worry about PIM if it doesn't impact your receive channels. However, looking at the narrow band, we can clearly tell that the PIM has impacted our four channels. And you can see there's a fifth one. I point to it in the orange because that's not my channel, but that's also a PIM, but it doesn't impact any of my other channels. So the, the four receiving channels are already impacted by PIM, and we can see the spikes. And the fifth one is not a channel of ours, so we don't have to worry about it. That is a good example to show you how PIM can act on the whole spectrum. And sometimes PIM only impacts the transmitter side, sometimes it impacts the receiver side. In this case, it impacted both, and we can see that the receiver side is hugely impacted by the PIM. In this particular scenario, what I went and I've done, I replaced the normal connectors that they've had for so long, we replaced them with PIM rated connectors, and everything went back to normal. I hope this video was beneficial for you. I just wanted to make it quick, to deliver some ideas for you about PIM and show you how PIM is in real life. And when you're testing, how would you witness it on the spectrum analyzer? Please feel free to reach out to me for any comments or feedback. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll be making more videos in the near future. And also feel free to visit my website and you can also reach out to me through comments or email if you'd like to have a copy of the presentation. Thank you for your time.